On Saturday, a tentative debt ceiling deal was reached, but there has been plenty of opposition. In today's video, I'm going to cover what's in the deal, the opposition in Congress, and the potential impact on global markets. So first off, let's talk about what's in the U.S. debt ceiling deal. So debt ceiling is suspended until 2025. There'll be caps on spending, but not on defense. Unspent COVID funds will be returned. Welfare was tinkered with, but no overhaul. Funds to enforce tax rules on wealthy Americans. It's going to be easier to get energy project permits. What are things that are not in the deal that Republicans um, wanted to be rescinded was student loan re relief. Republicans also want to re repeal key provisions of the Inflation Reduction Act's clean energy and climate provisions. That's also not in there, clean energy. And there's also tax hikes. So Democrats had one to target wealthy Americans for new tax hikes. So these are things that were not in the deal. And these are things that were in the deal. So now that we know what's in the deal, let's talk about some of the opposition that came within the divided Congress. So keep in mind, even though that Congress is divided, McCarthy and Biden have came out publicly and said that they're confident that this bill is going to pass. And obviously, if it doesn't, by June 5th, we will reach a default and that will be catastrophic for many Americans. Government employees won't be able to get paid. Unemployment will spike. It will just be an absolute disaster. So let's think about what some of these representatives are saying. So Repub uh, Representative Ralph Norman, who is a Republican, um, said that Republicans are the only ones who can bring fiscal sanity to Congress. This deal with the White House fails to uphold that responsibility. Republican uh, Representative Matt Rosendale said, $4 trillion to the existing $31 trillion national debt is an insult to the American people to support a piece of legislation that continues to put our country's financial future at risk. So people are really worried that we're just increased spending and we're going to go further into debt, which I'm definitely worried about myself. But at the same time, we need to come to some sort of deal here to make sure that we don't get ourselves into a default, which would be even worse. So Representative Dan Bishop said he doubled down on his earlier condemnation uh, of the deal when he retweeted criticism of the bill by Twitter's Elon Musk. Elon said incompetence in the limit is indistinguishable from sabotage. And then he, he said, is he thinking what I think he's thinking? He'd be right. So he's definitely not happy about this, but let's see what some of the Democrats are saying about this. So Greg, uh, Kasser said nobody's vote should be taken for granted, and there are a lot of really concerning parts in this bill. On the other hand, House Minority Leader Hakeem Jeffries, who's also a Democrat, said President Biden has delivered a result that avoids a catastrophic default. Separately, there were some doubts by Senate, uh, where Washington Post notes at least nine Republicans would have to join all 51 Democrats to pass the legislation for Biden to sign into law. So that's really not that many. So keep that in mind. Obviously, there is a lot of opposition, but it still seems that this bill is going to pass. But we really have no idea. So Senator Lindsey Graham, who's Republican, said that, uh, you know, I understand compromise, but I don't understand putting our defense capabilities at serious risk in the name of compromise. The 2011 budget deal was a disaster to our nation's defense. I have fears this proposal is shaping up to be even worse. Stay tuned, he added. Senator Ted Cruz, who's also Republican from Texas, said, that the bill was a blank check for Democrats, which in some cases I do agree and see what some of these Republicans are saying. Um, the two party system really just puts our country against each other, which is pretty sad to see. But in general, we're always going to have differing oppositions and differing viewpoints. So I definitely get where Ted Cruz is coming from here. But at the same time, we do, like I said, need to come some sort to some sort of agreement here. Senator J.D. Vance, who's a Republican from Ohio, Retweet a tweet by Roy Sunday morning that denounced the deal with the comment, the more I learn about this debt ceiling deal, the more I think it's bad news. So now that we know what's in the deal and potentially some of the opposition, let's talk about some of the impacts on the global markets here. So even though the US and UK markets are closed today, the European stock index slipped a little bit uh, today on Monday. While the futures remain uh, positive, uh, you know, because we reached a debt ceiling deal over the weekend. So President Joe Biden and top uh, congressional Republican Kevin McCarthy reached a tentative deal on Saturday to raise the federal government's 31.4 trillion debt ceiling, aiming to stop the US from defaulting on its debt. So they reached this deal on Saturday. I apologize if I said they reached this deal yesterday. So the deal is expected to provide only short-term relief for markets as worries linger about inflation and further rate increases. Wall Street futures rose, 
with S&P 500 E-minis up 0.3% and NASDAQ E-minis up 0.4%. But like I said, the US and UK uh, markets are closed on Monday for public holidays. If the debt ceiling deal passes through Congress, then market attention will return to the US Federal Reserve uh, plans for rates. So I think this is kind of just a distraction from all the other catastrophes that are going on right now. People are going to be going back to worrying about inflation. They're going to be worrying about rate hikes. They're going to be worrying about geopolitical pressures. Um, there's going to be a lot of things that people are going to be worried about. And as the markets have already increased a ton this year, it's going to be interesting to see what happens once this deal kind of settles into the dust. So growth, particularly in the U.S., remains quite resilient. Inflation is pretty sticky. We're back to the narrative where the Fed has to push hard to bring inflation down. And that's obviously going to create some sort of market anxiety because as you price in rate hikes rather than rate cuts, you put pressure on valuations. So I agree with that statement a lot. We're going to take a look at the NASDAQ chart just after this. Markets are leaning towards expecting the Fed to raise rates by 25 basis, basis points next month, then keep rates steady for the, the rest of the year. So we'll see what happens next month with that. The Fed's preferred inflation gauge, the preferred consumption expenditures price index, came in higher than expected on Friday, and two-year U.S. yields hit their highest in more than two months after the data. So this is going to be really interesting to watch what happens after this deal passes. Sure, leading up to it, this might provide some relief now that people know that we're probably not going to hit a default as long as this passes. But there's a lot of other pressures on the markets here and a lot of other people calling for a recession. So I'm really interested to see what's going to happen to, let's say, the S&P and the NASDAQ after this. Now, we saw this big increase here, 32%, right? That's a massive, massive increase. But what could happen is, is we're here kind of at some resistance here around the 350 level on NASDAQ. If we kind of, you know, break down and we break down below this 335 level, I could see us going potentially even all the way back to the lows here in December. So that would be a big, big drop off and something to keep an eye on. A lot of people have made good money in large cap tech stocks. We're talking Google, Amazon, Facebook, NVIDIA. You know, the NASDAQ has done really well with some individual stocks being up almost 100%. So I think people are going to be looking to shift into other sectors that have lagged behind or even just get 5% plus in their money market account. So that's something to keep in mind. Obviously, this is not financial advice. And I'm not telling you that you should think about selling your whole portfolio, but you should definitely think, what is going to be good for me? Do I have a long time horizon and I don't want to touch my portfolio? Do I have a shorter time horizon and I want to take some profits here? You should definitely have a plan in mind and stick to that plan. Thank you guys so much for watching. I would appreciate it if you guys could like, comment, and subscribe. And I'll catch you guys in the next one.